you read the affidavit and you just find out that nobody understands exactly why, but he was stalking them, he was hunting them. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is up to death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. This was probably a person that blends into the background. Yeah, we're at from Pennsylvania, we actually don't have like crosswalks. His neighbors and people who know him superficially would probably never guess that he had any violent tendencies. It's disgusting to think about someone that you stay out with all the time to do something like this. Are you waiving your right to a speedy preliminary hearing? Yes. If you got to know him well, you would see layers of things that were a bit off or different. What I do know is that Brian did have anger issues. You could tell there was something off about him. Very quiet, calculated about what he says. Actually very similar to the how he walked into court. No different. I'm just curious about the law. I don't mean to... Oh, no, yeah, I yeah, can find it for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything that I've read about Brian Koberger would fit the type of person that we would expect for doing a crime like this. The details about Brian Koberger's life before he was charged in the quadruple homicide, they are limited. But there are some things that we know about the suspect. Koberger, who was originally from Pennsylvania, received a bachelor's degree from DeSale University in 2020. And he completed a graduate program at DeSale as well. In November of 2022, when the University of Idaho murders occurred, Koberger was enrolled as a criminology graduate student, PhD program at nearby Washington State University, Pullum Campus. That's where he was pulled over for a traffic violation on campus back in November. There's body cam footage of that traffic stop that has been released and Koberger is seen speaking to this law enforcement officer about why he was stopped and he doesn't really let it go. There's not really a great option there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just slightly into the crosswalk, so, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, where I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, we mm -hmm. actually don't have, like, crosswalks. Oh, So even if you're, if you're kind of slightly, they have, there's a little bit more leeway as well. Like, there are a few lines, like, there's one white line and there's another one mm -hmm. like there's like a like a certain yeah. margin from which you can actually kind of put your vehicle place your vehicle mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so i know laws vary state to state but there is a law yeah. in washington for blocking an intersection like that proceeding through when yeah. it, you don't um when you're just stalling i forget the actual verbiage i can find it for you but it's like stalling blocking an intersection yeah. i'm just curious about yeah. the law i don't mean to oh no yeah i yeah, can I find like it for you yeah thing. And what happens after that, the officer goes back to her vehicle. She looks up the law, looks up the website that the law is on, and she goes back and has to read him the statute and tell him, this is where you look up laws if you are interested. And he goes on for another two or three minutes back and forth with the officer. Joining us now to talk about all of this, Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen, and in Nashville, Tennessee, legal commentator, former Los Angeles deputy district attorney, podcaster, and YouTube host of The Emily Show, Emily D. Baker is with us. Thank you both for weighing in on this. Emily, let me start with you. Is he a wannabe officer, a wannabe lawyer in the way that you hear him going back and forth with this officer? What's interesting is that he says where he's from in Pennsylvania, they don't even have crosswalks, and then proceeds to talk about how there's more layway and the layout of the crosswalks. So I don't know if he wants to be an attorney, but he's caught himself in his own misstatement saying there's no crosswalks and then actually they're set up differently. But I think he wanted to continue to talk and we saw that in every single one of his traffic stops that he, he has quite a lot to say, not as much to say in court today though, however. Jason, what's your take on him arguing this out with the officer and really not letting it go? It goes for a total of 15 minutes, this entire stop. Your observation is spot on. Uh, he really has an argumentative spirit about these things rather than just being polite and courteous and just get through the traffic stop. Traffic violations are strict liability. You don't have to be first on it. You just have to you know, be, you're expected to know it before you're entered that state and operate a motor vehicle. So if he's wrong, he's wrong. He just tries to be polite and get his way through it, but he wants to argue instead. 
I want to quickly play something uh, that has to do with his return to Pennsylvania. So this is when he was in Washington there that we just saw in video, but he went back home for the holiday season. That was in December of 2022. And according to a recent NBC Dateline episode, The Killings on King Road, Koberger's own sister became suspicious of his involvement in the Idaho murders during his time at home. According to our source, investigators learned the following. One of Brian's two older sisters, home for the holidays, brought up an uncomfortable topic. The sister had noticed Brian had been wearing latex gloves. She thought it odd. And at some point, the sister, quite loudly, pointed out that at the time of the murders in Moscow, Brian had lived just a few miles away in Pullman, and that Brian drove a white Elantra, a car that law enforcement across the nation was looking for. Add that to the gloves, and the sister said she thought the Koberger family should consider that Brian might have killed the four students in Moscow. Now the piece goes on, Emily, to say that his father felt strongly it was not the case. And then we know by December 30th is when SWAT was kicking in their door, the FBI coming in and taking him under arrest and seizing things inside of their family home. But this is big information for a family that's watching him as he's moving inside of their home, is it not? This is a lot of information. I wonder if Brian Koberger was worried that the law enforcement was going to go through the trash and try to find fingerprints and DNA, which is exactly what they did. And they only found familial DNA to his father. And it would be very odd indeed to have someone walking around the family home constantly wearing gloves, given all the other circumstances. I'm not surprised it raised alarm bells. I'm more surprised that the sister talked to the media about it. Well, it sounds like they have a source who gave them that information. But Jason Jensen wanted to ask you a similar question to that reaction to that information. We know when we saw the search warrant in this case that the police did recover four medical style latex gloves. And it seemed a bit strange that that would have anything to do with the accusations in this case because he wasn't in the area anymore. Why would he still need gloves when he's at home? But it seems like that answers a bit of the question. Yeah, exactly. With him being a criminology, you know, major going to, for his doctorate, he's going to know about police techniques like trash poles and things of that nature. So clearly wearing his gloves at home, he's preparing for that just in such an event. So it's not a surprise, but it should have sent alarm bells for the entire family. But for the parents being in denial, they should, should have been the first ones to call in something like that.